I am Suresh Jora, publisher and managing editor of uh, South Asian Outlook and president North America of Global Home Media, the publisher of uh, South Asian Outlook, which was launched as an electronic monthly in July 2001. The word Global Home means global and Sanskrit word Home emphasizing that despite social, cultural, economic and political diversity in disparities, we are one world. At Global Home, we believe in the right to freedom of expression. Today my guest is Honorable Jim Carriganis, Member of Parliament, Scarborough Indian Court and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of uh, Human Resources, Skills, Development Canada. Thank you for bringing me in your program. It's indeed a pleasure to be with you and uh, good luck in your endeavors in the future. Thank you. Uh, Jim was elected to the House of Commons in 1988 as the Member of Parliament for Scarborough Asian Court. On June 28, 2004, he was re-elected re to the House of Commons for a fifth consecutive term with 64% uh, of the popular vote in his writing, which was among the top three writings in Ontario. Uh, Jim, and I don't, and I don't want to be, I don't want to sound cocky, but God willing, good fortunes, I might be reelected for a sixth time. Okay, we look forward to that. Thank <laughs> you. Jim, you were born in Athens, Greece, in 1966, and immigrated to Canada with your parents. What were your early experiences in Canada? Times in Canada in the late 60s and the early 70s were certainly not the times that we know today. There was more built-in prejudice to uh, against the new Canadians. There was more name calling than it is today. It wasn't until the middle 70s when the acceptance started building up in Canada, when we had the Multicultural Act, and when we started having people starting to accept the new Canadians. In the late 50s, early 60s, there were Italians, Greeks immigrating to Canada, and there was no diversity. There was no, uh, the people that we have today, the diversity of color, the diversity of ethnicities, the diversity of religion, that was not present at this time. But now there's more present, and the experiences now for the new immigrants are far, far better than they, they were back in the late 60s and the early 70s. There were tougher times, the, um, there was tougher times at school, and it was not this integration and, and acceptance that we have today. There's a lot of Paki bashing, as they used to call it, in the early 70s. Oh, uh, there was also uh, Greek monkeys, and uh, the Italians were called WAPs, W-O-P, because they were coming over to Canada without papers, and, and there was DP, uh, di uh, displaced people. There was more, there was less tolerance of the new immigrants, there was less acceptance. At this time in time, we have more acceptance, we have more respect for our new immigrants. And not only that, at this time, you even got people going out and saying, okay, how can we help the new immigrants? There's more need to help the new immigrants. There's more desire to help the new immigrants than it was back in the late 60s and early 70s. How did growing up in Canada help uh, shape your personality? The, um, the difficulties that uh, my family, the difficulties that I experienced in the late 60s, early 70s, certainly made the determination of me to, uh, to reach out uh, and, and be one stronger more determined, and three, to, to, to accept the surroundings, and not only accept my surroundings, but also accept the people that are, I'm, I'm, I'm assisting, the people that I'm representing. This is one of the most ethnically diverse writings in Canada, yeah, probably the first or second, and representing over 170,000 different ethnicities and all these different religious certainly has, has given me the pleasure not only to understand what the world is about, but it also has shaped my being and, and what I am. What I believe in. What and where did you study in Canada after migrating from Athens? I um, started in grade six, and at that point in time, my English was very limited. And I remember um, growing up and having difficulties of expression and having difficulties being able to communicate. And then I continued in high school, um, and I uh, went to University of Toronto and I studied industrial engineering at uh, University of Toronto. One of the engineering courses was to be one of the toughest courses. I had pleasure. Um, it was a hard course. We, uh, we studied hard. And we, uh, we partied hard, and, and um, I also uh, the, I, my last years of university, I was married. And uh, I remember when I was graduating, my my oldest daughter was born. She was two months old. So I had the pleasure of my graduation to be uh, a young man, a graduate, and a father, and, uh, and a husband. And certainly, that uh, I think that was the start of my of my career. That's great. 
How has your family background uh, contributed to your success in politics? You know, every time that um, we were taught at university as an engineer that every time you put pen on paper, you have to make sure that for the action that you're doing, that there is a reaction which is positive to, to, to the people that you're serving. My family values, my education certainly have shaped up the person that I am. They've shaped up the desire to, to help and, um, and the desire to, to look after my constituents as well as to, to, to represent Canada and, and work for people in, in my constituency and for Canada and for the greater cause of the world abroad. And certainly that has shaped my, um, my ability to interact and my ability to, to, to be who I am. Jim, uh, you represent Asian Court, the Scarborough Asian Court which is one of the, as you said, most uh, ethnically diverse federal writings in Canada. How do you succeed in taking their concerns on a wide variety of issues? You know, you don't just represent people in Scarborough Asian Court. One of the things that you hear from people from all over the world is, do you know where I come from? Do you know what my place looks like? Do you know the village that I was born in? And one of the things that I try to do is not only represent my constituents, but also when occasion arises and the need arises to go to their place of birth, the place where they come from, in order for me to be able to understand. I'll give you an example. When just recently in the last year we had major earthquakes, major major disasters, when tsunami hit. The first thing that I was asked by people is, we're gonna pay your way to go to, to Sri Lanka to see firsthand what it was. You know, I ended up paying my own way to go to Sri Lanka. But going to Sri Lanka, going on the place where the devastation was, going on the beach where people had killed, certainly shaped myself and made me understand what the people were going through, made me understand the difficulties that the individuals were suffering, as well as what it was needed from the Canadian aspect in order for us to be there to help. So this is what I try to integrate. Not only do I need to represent you in Canada, but I also need to learn where you come from, I need to learn your background, and I need to learn how the the, the, your background and how it shapes your lives in Canada and what can we do in Canada to help you as well as to help you help the, the, help the diaspora, be it the South Asian diaspora, be it the Greek diaspora, the Italian, the Chinese diaspora, all the different diversities that we have in Canada. How do we help them shape Canada to be a better place and how then we catapult that to make Canada to be the best country in the world? Uh, on a different topic, uh, what are your views on same-sex marriage? I voted against same-sex marriage. I. Uh, I will continue to support traditional family values and um, because of um, my family, my background, my religion and my constituents. And you don't feel yourself at odds with the caucus? As they actually, say? actually, no. You know, the, the Conservative Party um, talks big, the Conservative Party talks a lot, but when you look at freedom of the vote, on a, especially in a same-sex marriage, the only party that was allowed its members to vote freely and vote their conscience. We were not roped in, we were not muzzled, we were not hand-tied in order to vote with a party line. It was the Liberal Party. You had one-third of the Liberal Party caucus, members of the Liberal Party, voting against same-sex marriage. You had a cabinet minister that did not feel comfortable in voting for same-sex marriage. He resigned his seat. And you did not have a backlash against him from other caucus members or the Prime Minister. Joe Camusi voted against same-sex marriage. He resigned his cabinet seat. And the Prime Minister said, Joe Camusi is a good friend of mine, and I respect his decision. Unlike the NDP party, when Bev Desjardins voted against the, uh, uh, the party line which was to support same-sex marriage, and they threw it completely out of the party. Not only did they throw it out of the party, they went one farther, and they made sure that she lost her nomination. None of the members that voted against same-sex marriage on the liberal side lost their nomination, were ostracized, or even thrown out of the party. So, you know, you hear Mr. Layton, and you hear Mr. Uh, Mr. Harper going on about it, I got news for you. The only party that allows its members to freely express their concerns, not only in same sex but other, all other issues, is the Liberal Party. Now, there's a lot of uh, talk about gun violence in uh, Toronto, especially. Last year there were 52 people killed, quite a few of them by using of guns. What do you think about the justice system where the criminals are protected and have more rights than the victims? Well, no longer there. Let me start by expressing my, uh, my condolences and my sympathies to all the family members that have lost uh, family um, to, um, to such atrocities. Um, guns are certainly a problem. Um, violent crimes are certainly a problem. And the fact that we have 
thugs and um, gangs is certainly something we've got to cut to, to grips with. One of the things that the Prime Minister said at the beginning of December is that we're going to ban, ban gan, uh, hand, handguns completely outright. And certainly that was one good move, and I'll tell you why. Because in Scarborough, we had a house broken in and guns were stolen from a collector. And out of those guns, 12 of those guns were used for committing a crime, and one of those guns was used to kill an innocent individual. And when I'm talking to his father, he told me that his son was killed because somebody wanted to go into the gang, and this was the ritual of joining the gang. So, do we need guns? No. The only people that need guns are the people that are protecting us, and that is the police. Everybody else that needs to have handguns um, for collection or other reasons, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the people of Scarborough is concerned, as far as what I'm hearing on the street, nobody wants them, nobody desires them. Now, you don't only just take a look at the criminal, okay, you did something bad, we're going to throw you in jail, and that's going to be it. And especially the handgun, the banning of the handguns, we're increasing the, 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 the minimum sentencing, we're doubling it in order for if you commit a crime with a handgun, you go to jail twice as long, mandatory minimum. However, one of the things that we also need is that we need to have programs. And we need to have programs that reflect the need of the community. We, we started working with the community, we went down that route, but the difficulty was that during the conservative years of the common sense revolution, as Mr. Harper called it, that he said, you know what, we don't need the schools after, after ours, let's shut them down. To, to save a couple of bucks so we can give it to our rich friends. So what ended up happening, you ended up having youth after 3, 30, 4 o'clock roaming the streets, nothing to do. So we need to make sure that we invest in the families, we invest in the, in the children in order to open the schools, in order to have programs after hours. And this is where the federal government is now coming to fill that void. This is where we started having programs through the Minister of Human Resources Skills Development and uh, in my mandate, I'm working with the minister, uh, I'm the key person, the lead person, in order to make sure that we deliver programs and we look at areas that need help. My area is one of those designated as needing help and I'm working very diligently to make sure that we get work programs, after our programs, family programs in order to service our community, in order to fill the void that was left during the conservative years, the provincial conservative years. But how about the justice system where a young offender, say 17 years, he can use a gun but he cannot be named, he cannot be prosecuted uh, as a regular offender. This the person is who is, uh, sorry, the person who is uh, big enough to have a gun and shoot somebody should be recognized as an adult. This is something that goes back to the early 80s, the, the, the Young Offenders Act. Um, I proposed amendments and some of the amendments that I proposed at that time were certainly defeated by the Conservative government and later were adopted by other governments. One of the amendments that I proposed is if you're over 14 and you commit a crime, a heinous crime, that you would be tried in adult court as an adult and receive adult sentencing. Some of that has been, um, has been adopted and we're hoping that as we move along that we address not only the difficulties that bring the young person there, but we also address the system of how, you know, we, we, a comprehensive package. And this is what we're trying to do. It doesn't come overnight. There's, as you understand, there's many uh, provinces. There's ten provinces. There's three territories. There's a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of community groups that we have to make sure that we have a, a balanced approach. You can come to a community and say, you know what, you got a problem. Here's two billion dollars. Fix it. Well, throwing money at something does not fix it. But making sure that the money is used wisely, making sure that the money goes to the right place, that's what is needed. And after the lessons learned in, um, the, difficult, in the difficulties in working with, 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 with all the stakeholders, we've got to make sure that stakeholders not only receive the money that they need, but the money is accountable and the money does, it does serve the people that it's intended to do so. Uh, you have been quite active during the 2005, which is uh, the year of disasters all over the world. What would you consider to be your biggest achievement? Let me start by again, um, to the viewers that have lost family during those disasters, be it in the tsunami, be it in Guyana, be it in Pakistan, the earthquake, be it in Indonesia, be it in the States, Katrina, please accept uh, our, um, our condolences. We wish you the best uh, in trying to put your family back together again and your lives in May 2006 be a year of prosperity for you, a year that brings you uh, peace and love, and certainly a year that helps you get over the difficulties that you've had. I think my biggest challenge, or my biggest, uh, something that I will never forget all my life, 
something that certainly has me sometimes wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats is when I witnessed bodies of people that couldn't be moved in Sri Lanka and they were burned right on the beach. When I witnessed disaster completely on the whole beach and the only thing that was left standing in Tripambali, 150 yards from the beach, was a little Hindu temple. When I went to, um, to Indonesia, and everything, the wave came in for 7.1 kilometers. The sides of the mountains were just sheared off. And there's a mosque standing. And you can see it in pictures. But to go back after a year and to see the mosque standing and to, just to go into the mosque, and I'm not a Muslim, I'm, I'm a Christian, but to go sit down, take your shoes off, and pray. I, you know, I don't know if I prayed to, to, to my God, their God, but I just prayed. There's just, only one God. I, I know, but you know, I, in different faiths, there's only one God. But, you know, I prayed, and then I said, look at this. Everything around here was destroyed. And yet this mosque, this, this little Hindu temple, this little small church that was built a hundred years ago, is still left standing. It makes you wonder, and 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 it has me coming up with cold sweats. There's another um, another incident, and I think you know when you talk about something that something leaves behind, you know something is left behind to commemorate what happened in Hiroshima, like the clock. The, um, in Indonesia, there was a um, a power generating ship, which was two football fields long, two soccer fields long and about eight stories high. And this was brought in 2.7 kilometers. This is like almost two miles from the coast, right above houses, right above mosques, and it's just sat there, right in the middle of nothing, just sat there. And as soon as the tsunami was over, this was a power generating ship that created hydro. People went in, put a plug in, brought it, uh, you know, oil, and it's still working, and it's just sitting there. It weighs 13,000 tons. That's the miracle. That's, that's the size of, I mean, half the, half the part of a building. Just blown on. Just, I'm sitting there and I said, this, so, you know, um, it certainly has some, some things to remember and some things that shape you and who you are. And, 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 and when you service the people, you sort of put that into perspective. What would you think is your uh, best achievement over the five terms that you've had in the world? It's not, you know, I'm not sure if it's a best, I'm not sure if it's a serious of, but every time somebody calls up and says, thank you, the case that you were working on certainly uh, was successful. Thank you for joining with my family. Thank you for getting me on my pension. Thank you for, for you know, for, for, for helping, like, shape my life up, even for 30 seconds. I think that's uh, that's a miracle in itself, and that's an, achie an everyday achievement. There's been milestones, but uh, every little one, you know, you don't disregard one in order to do it, to, to hug another. There's a series of, you know, it's a pleasure to be there. And uh, hopefully you'll be elected for the sixth term. What are your plans? From your, from your mouth to God's ear. Um, the, the plan that we have as a government is to, uh, first of all, I, I do hope that we get elected in a majority situation. So this nonsense of, uh, that has been going on, this foolishness that has been going on for the last uh, year and a half in part of it, it does not continue. We as a government have a plan. It's a balanced approach. I mean, look at our track record. Eight consecutive balanced budgets. We took a country that was virtually bankrupt, a country that was uh, in, in the world stage, was going to be almost ready to, to join uh, one of the poorest countries in the world. And, and from having a deficit of $42 billion, we now have surpluses. We started paying down the debt. Um, the Brian Mulroney under the Conservatives doubled the debt from 370 million up to 560 billion. We've paid down the debt. We are now saving three billion dollars a year, billion, not million, billion dollars a year that we can put into programs because we have less uh, debt to, to carry and, and, and what it costs to service that debt. Uh, there's a lot of plans that are on the table, but my my immediate plan, my my most, my my personal immediate plan is to. To visit the areas where I was last year after the devastation, Sri Lanka and India, and see firsthand the reconstruction process and see firsthand what has been going on. I just came back about a month and a half ago from visiting, um, being in Kashmir. And it's like the whole city of Toronto, living in tents. 
people that died were the size of my riding. It's like me losing virtually everybody that I represent. That's a nightmare in itself. And, and how is the international community coping? And how is the international community there to assist the people of government? That's what I want to see first and, for, first and, and foremost myself and, and first hand. It's good to know about your achievements and your satisfaction, but uh, over the years you must be having some disappointments. And why so? Ah, uh, there have been some disappointments when you try to bring um, some requests to ministers and ministers will say things your way. You have, let's say, uh, internal struggles with be it this minister or that minister. Uh, I, I think one of the, uh, my biggest disappointments is that uh, I was not able to help a family whose, um, the woman was dying and she needed to have two people visit her, her brother and her, and her sister from another part of the world. And unfortunately, even with my own personal uh, intervention, intervention. Uh, the minister not see fit to live that person's family come to visit and to, to be at the at the person's funeral and, and before that to see them before they were dying and for whatever reason I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not going to go into it but certainly that was I think my, one of my personal uh, disappointments um, fortunately that minister is not at that position anymore and um, would have been personal differences that I had with the minister or the minister seeing that particular case as a case that did not want intervention. That's certainly, I think, one of the biggest dissatisfactions that I've had in, the, in my 16, 17 years of parliament. People have a very negative view of uh, politicians as such. And uh, what are your views on that? I've had the pleasure of representing the people of Scarborough for five terms, 17 years. I hope to get re-elected. Um, Politicians normally are, uh, anything goes wrong, you blame the local politician. It snows too much, the street's not cleaned after two hours, you blame the local politician. Uh, there's an earthquake, you find some way of blaming the local politician. You know, you people need a scapegoat, and sometimes, unfortunately, the scapegoats are the politicians. Um, I've had a, a good rapport with my constituents. I'm happy with the people that I represent. They're happy with me, they keep returning me. You know what, if some people are satisfied and some people want to blame me, that is fine, but at the end of the day, when people return you to Parliament, and people are, you know, when you walk to a person's store and say, thank you for what you did for me then, you sort of sit there and say, okay, thank you, and you don't even remember, you know, and, and um, the amount of success that we have, I think in our writing, the, uh, that view is, uh, is not widely shared by a lot of people, but again, you got to blame somebody. If the, uh, if the weather is bad, you blame the local politician. If it snows, you blame the politician. What's your message to our viewers? On January 23rd, you have a choice to make. A choice of voting for the Liberal Party or the other candidates that knock on your door. Ladies and gentlemen, there's two things that I also have to leave with you. One, do exercise the right and the option to vote. In some of the countries that we come from, I know in my birth country when we left Greece in 66, there was seven years of dictatorship and you could not vote. This is something that this country allows you to do, to vote and to be voted upon. Exercise your right. Do not let that option of voting go to waste. Do not let that option of being able to cast your vote. Do not sit at home and do nothing. Other people will tell you to vote for the Conservatives and other people will tell you to vote for the NDP. I would like to tell you why to vote for the Liberal Party. We remember the Conservative years, we remember the years of Brian Mulroney, and some of us that are even older and been in this country for a little longer might even remember different Baker. And we certainly remember Mike Harris and what they've done to this great country and this great province of ours. When the Liberal Party took its government in Canada in 1993, we were almost virtually bankrupt. We have eliminated the, def the, the, the debt. Nope. Let's start again. Sorry. On January 23rd, you have a choice to make. You have a choice of voting or not voting. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage every one of you to go and vote. However, as the weather is unpredictable at this time of the year, you have another option to do. You have an option to go and vote on the early uh, advance polls on the 13th of January, on the 14th of January, on the 6th of January. And you can also vote today until January the 17th at your local returning office. Please contact the uh, candidate in the writing and the person that you are supporting and find out where you can go and vote. This is an option that some of us that come to this country might not have the 
capability and might not have the pleasure of doing so. I remember when we came to this country in 1966, there was a dictatorship in Greece, and you couldn't vote and you couldn't run. So the fact that we live in a democratic right, in a democratic country, and the fact that we have the democratic right to go and vote, please exercise it. Other people will knock at your door and tell you to vote for the Conservatives, the NDP, we're knocking at your doors to go and vote for the Liberals. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1993, when the stewardship of this country was passed to the Liberals, this country was virtually bankrupt. We had a deficit of $42 billion. We had a debt that was $560 billion and growing exponentially year after year. In the last eight years, we have balanced budgets. We have a surplus. We have absolutely no more deficits. We have a surplus. We have started paying down the debt. We started paying down the mortgage. We started making sure that we have more money for our children. We have the lowest unemployment rate in this country in the last 30 years. Our interest rates are at 4 and 3.5%. Three and We're in the time of prosperity. This is an economic engine that drives the rest of the world. Canada is the best country in the G8. We do remember what was happening with Brian Mulroney. Let me, also not let me also not forget what happened with Mike Harris. We had people that were cutting, cutting, and cutting. We had people that virtually bankrupted this country. So ladies and gentlemen, the great prime ministers of this country, the liberal prime ministers of this country, the great prime minister that we have today deserves your support. The liberal party deserves to be returned in a majority situation so that we can govern the country and bring the programs that the people of Canada deserve and are asking us for. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being here. And certainly on January 23rd, exercise your option. Go and vote. And if you vote Liberal, I thank you. This country thanks you. Our Prime Minister thanks you. We wish you all the best in your re-election and also hope that you will be part of the new cabinet if Liberals form the government. Thank you for the best wishes, uh, for both uh, those wishes. And uh, hopefully on January 23rd night, uh, this country will, uh, will go to sleep and wake up with the majority Liberal government. That, that not only we, we want, but we deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you.